Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome the president of the George Washington University, Dr. Stephen Knapp. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the George Washington University, where we are honored to host today's conversation, a preview event for the 2013 Fortune Global Forum, which this year will be held in Chengdu, China. Each year, the forum brings together chief executives and global thought leaders to discuss international commerce and other global issues. This year, I'm delighted to announce that the George Washington University will become the first and so far the only educational partner for the Fortune Global Forum. The forum will provide uh, access to our students and faculty and alumni to some very important content that's developed there, but also Fortune will have access to our faculty expertise. And it's now a pleasure to introduce today's speakers for this preview event. Henry, better known as Hank Paulson, was sworn in as the 74th Secretary of the United States Department of the Treasury on July 10th, 2006. As Secretary, he was the President's leading policy advisor on a broad range of domestic and international economic issues. In 2011, he founded the Paulson Institute, a nonpartisan center at the University of Chicago committed to promoting sustainable economic growth and a cleaner environment. Before he entered public service, Secretary Paulson held several leadership positions at Goldman Sachs, including that of Chief Executive Officer. Secretary Paulson has long advocated the building of a stronger relationship between the United States and China. While at Goldman Sachs, he established the firm's China presence and promoting collaboration between the world's two largest economies has been a core focus of the Paulson Institute. He has written numerous articles on US-China relations, served as co-chairman of the Nature Conservancy's Asia Pacific Council, and supported research on Chinese investment in the United States. Andy Swerer was named managing editor of Fortune in October 2006. His responsibilities include overseeing Fortune Magazine and Fortune.com, with a combined audience of more than 11 million readers, as well as Fortune Digital Media and Fortune's conferences, including the Global Forum. Under Mr. Swerer's tenure, Fortune was named to both Adweek's hot list and AdAge's A-list in 2012. In 2010, Fortune won the Society of American Business Editors and Writers Award for Best in Business General Excellence. That year, the magazine also received a Loeb Award and a New York P Press Club Award for its 2009 reporting on Bernie Madoff. Mr. Swerer joined Fortune in 1985 as an intern from Columbia Journalism School and went on to serve as a reporter and editor of stories on Wall Street, investing, information technology, and entertainment. He is a regular guest on MSNBC's Morning Joe and CNBC's Squawk Box, and from 2001 to 2006, he served as the business anchor for CNN's American Morning. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary Hank Paulson and Mr. Andy Swerer. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Knapp. Uh, and thank you to everyone here at George Washington University. Um, and thank you to uh, all the students uh, and everyone else who's come here today. Uh, uh, we're delighted to, to see you all. And uh, also, thank you, Secretary Paulson, for uh, coming and uh, having this conversation with us. Um, let's get right to it. And uh, the conversation today, of course, is about China and the United States' relationship with China. And uh, as President Knapp suggested, uh, Hank is um, uniquely qualified to um, discuss this given his roles in government and at Goldman Sachs and in the nonprofit world. And each one of those roles um, is salient in a, in, a, in a unique way to what's going on in China and the relationship, the US-China relationship. So, um, and, and I think you'll see that. But let's get right to um, maybe the, the most important topic with regard to China right now, um, Mr. Secretary, which is the um, changeover in leadership. Um, and I know that uh, you've said, um, the good news is that President Xi Jinping is a strong leader. Uh, the bad news is that he has to be one. And uh, I wonder if you could um, explain uh, exactly what you mean by that. 
Yes, Andy, and, and let me also say it's, it's good to be back in Washington, if only for a day, and particularly good to be here with, uh, with all of you. And uh, Andy, you stole my line there, you know, that the, that, uh, yes, he is, he, you have a, he, he's a strong leader, and they have a strong leadership team. And um, we can talk a little bit about that, but there's, I, I think they've got some real challenges, and that this leadership team is going to be tested by challenges domestically and internationally over the next 10 years. You know, managing that economy on the, the scale uh, that, that, that they have to manage it. And give, given the pace of change, it's just unprecedented. And their, uh, th their current uh, uh, economic model, I think, is, is running out of steam. So I think they need to, to reinvent that. He has uh, some other major uh, challenges. You know, he's got the, uh, uh, you know, he really needs to make s some big changes on governance. Mm -hmm. uh, to institute the rule of law, which, which is very necessary for continued uh, uh, business and, uh, you know, economic and political uh, success. Uh, there's, the environment is a big area of concern and, 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 and protest, and so needing to address the dirty air, the, the dirty water. Uh, corruption again, which is infuriating a lot of Chinese, particularly over, you know, issues like property rights and so on, is, uh, is, is a big challenge. Um, this is, this leader is, I, I think, particularly strong. The, uh, the Standing Committee, which is the senior leadership group of the party, the Standing Committee of the Politburo is now seven rather than, than five. It's going to be much easier to reach consensus. Uh, Xi Jinping, uh, the president, and Li Keqiang, the premier, are the only two members that are not term limited. So they will be there presumably for 10 years. The other five are really good at getting things done. Um, and uh, expectations are very high in, in the country. You would have to, to sort of look back and just remember how high expectations were here after President Obama was elected. Mm -hmm. That uh, they're high because uh, there's a general perception, which I agree with, which reforms had stalled for, for, for at least five years. Uh, and th there's a lot to be done. Uh, they're high because his leadership style is, is, is very appealing, uh, very different. He speaks extemporaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, he's said that when people meet with him, you know, bureaucrats aren't to come in and, 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 and just read talking points. Uh, that uh, he is, is, is really spoken out against some of the abuses of power uh, and some of the perks. You know, he wants to, there to be, to, to, to do away with so many of these motorcades that disrupt traffic. Uh, you're not to have sumptuous entertaining. I, when I had uh, lunch at the, um, at the embassy here to, a couple of months ago to say goodbye to Ambassador Zhang, I came away a little bit hungry. Instead of the standard eight or nine course <laughs> lunch, there was four <laughs> courses and a soup. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he said there will be no more hard liquor served in the military entertains, and the you know, liquor company stocks drop 10% the next day. There, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's not as many people in the VIP waiting rooms in the casinos at Macaw. So that, that there's, so he's done some things symbolically and you know, he understands the role the private sector's gotta play. So I think expectations are high, but there's a lot that uh, needs to be done. And it's, it's, it's a really a difficult challenge uh, running an economy where you just take a look at what's happened. Never in the history of the world is any, uh, country that size had so much change so quickly. And the expectations of the Chinese people are continuing to grow. And so to continue to manage that change and to, to, to put in place reforms on the scale in which he's going to have to do it uh, in the face of vested interests and right. people that are going to be fighting for the status quo, he, he, they've got their, this leadership team has got their work cut out for them. And you touched on a number of challenges in terms of the economy switching from a um, 
production economy to a consumption economy, um, the environmental factors, um, the political factors vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, some of the neighbors you haven't even touched upon. But I want to talk about corruption because when I talk to people in China, they seem to indicate that that could be problem number one. And the feeling among some people in China, many people in China perhaps, is that to get ahead in China, you don't play by the rules. And the feeling that that is something that has changed, that is different from what it was 10 years ago, and that this is something that uh, President Xi um, needs to address and is very keen on addressing. Do you think that's correct? Yeah, well, let's step back a little bit and uh, talk about rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the reason I started off when I talked about the challenge, I, I talked about instituting the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And as you look at the history of China's economic reform, they've moved very, very quickly. And so to move that quickly, uh, they used pilot programs, they encouraged innovation and uh, various activities which were really ahead of the rules that they had in place. And it's been a country uh, it, it's, it's a country ruled by men as opposed to law. It, it, that's probably an oversimplification. But I think the reason that I and so many others went as frequently as we did to China was relationships very, were very, very important. But the, the country is now at a size and a, a scale where for them to be successful, they are going to need to engage in institution building whether it's, and to, uh, to, to be able to implement, to be able to not only have laws in Beijing and rules, but to be able to implement and enforce those rules mm -hmm. across a wide range of areas, you know, from, from, from the environment to various, you know, the securities laws and, 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 and so on. And so I, I think a lot of this has to do with, with, uh, with, not just rules at institutions, but it has to do with good governance and transparency. And I re really believe that the only way you, for this to work is both the leaders and citizens have got to be invested in a rules-based uh, in, in rules system. Mm -hmm. So now you, you, you come to corruption because that, I, I, it, it, this is a this is a serious problem, and it is infuriating people. And I would say the biggest source, you know, of of anger, uh, or, you know, there are a number of sources, but one of the biggest sources has to do with with, with, with property rights and uh, municipal officials taking, uh, you know, s selling land, um, w which is one of the big financing vehicles for for urbanization, but. Going after that uh, corruption, they've uh, the, the head of the disciplinary committee and a member of the standing committee is Wang Shishan, right. who we know well here. He was my counterpart with the SED. He's been one of the top economic re reformers in China. He knows how to get things done. The SED was the strategic. Yeah, economic right. Dialogue. Excuse me, the strategic economic dialogue, mm -hmm. and um, so he's he's a doer. And this is not an easy challenge because right. you 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 have to go after it. I'm sure, looking at it systemically, uh, and and then they're going to need, and they already have had some some very well publicized examples. You know, in, in terms of government officials and business people, and uh, so this is this is a a significant problem, and it, it, she has said it's a significant problem, and they're they're taking it on, and it's not just in China. To just say, in much of the developing world, this is a. It is a significant problem. Perhaps it gets magnified by the rate of growth and it the- It gets magnified just because right. China is right. so large. But don't right. think that there's uh, more corruption in China than there is in India, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or it's it, it just, uh, uh, or m m many other places in the world. But because China is such a big engine in the world economy and, uh, and is, 
and, and there's so much change there that it's, uh, that, that it's a, a huge issue. And I do have questions from um, all of you or some of you that uh, you've submitted and we will get to those, but there are a lot of, a, a lot of other things we want to touch on first. Um, sustainability, I mentioned, is something that you're very keen on. Um, it's something that is really the focus of the uh, Paulson Initiative and the Paulson Institute. Um, having a sustainable uh, economic growth plan, um, uh, a model perhaps, or, or advising China and the United States on how to, how to uh, implement sustainable economic growth. And, and we hear about the um, environmental problems in China, uh, Mr. Secretary, and I'm frankly uh, a little bit surprised that they haven't been addressed uh, quicker, and I think I share that feeling with maybe some others. And uh, in fact, the problems seem to be getting worse over the past uh, couple of years and accelerating over the past couple of months. Of course, uh, the pollution in Beijing, uh, the dead pigs in the river in, in Shanghai, um, and then seeing stories in the paper this week uh, about these problems. Um, what will it take for China to really begin to address it? It seems at some point the cost of not doing anything will exceed the cost of, of sitting still, or right. of changing it, I should say. Now, Andy, as you said, you know, the, the Paulson Institute is a, you know, is a think and do tank. It's not for profit. And it's focused on US China because we are the two biggest economies in the world, biggest consumers of energy, biggest emitters of carbon. Um, and so a lot of it is focused around, our, our focus is on, you know, g having economic growth and having it be sustainable. It, everything from investment in the U.S., encouraging Chinese investment in the U.S. that leads to, uh, to, to more jobs in the U.S., to uh, leadership practices, best practices in business for the leaders of uh, the state-owned enterprises and other big companies in China that are seeking to become leading global uh, companies. And then a big part of it is on focused around sustainable urbanization, because mm -hmm. that will be, in my judgment, the biggest economic event of the first part of this century with another 300 million Chinese to go to the cities. And that's gonna be a driver of economic and environmental outcomes. And uh, you're right, we need a new model of growth. And let, let's talk, get, get to your question mm -hmm. specifically about the environment. Because as I explain it to people, the Chinese have been done some extraordinary things in terms of the amount of investment that they've made in alternative uh, sources of energy, clean technology, uh, the, the largest user of, of, of wind. Uh, they're going to be a huge user of solar. They've in, invested, they've got uh, a big percentage of the manufacturing capacity of solar uh, in the world. They've shut down many more dirty power plants than we have, but this is, they've been, winning some battles, but losing maybe the overall war because it, it, the, the, the good things they've done have been uh, overwhelmed by the pace of their growth. And uh, I think they, they, they now recognize it. it's the, the public is, is demanding it. And also, uh, you know, growth, is sustainability, I, I think, is, uh, to many people, it's just been a buzzword, and I, I, I think mm -hmm. people are, are are beginning to to really understand that uh, the growth model isn't sustainable. I mean, what's another point of GDP worth if people are dying from 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 dirty water, dirty air? There's all kinds of estimates about what the the drag is on economic yeah. growth from the from the dirty environment. Uh, some people believe several percentage points. But it's clearly not sustainable, and, and I think that all of us in the world need to need to really really rethink some things. Uh, you know, economic growth and in, environmental protection are not at odds; they're opposite sides of the same coin. If you're looking at it on a longer-term view, and you're looking at longer-term prosperity, and I think the Chinese and all of us need a, 
new economic framework that basically says uh, we, we need a model of economic growth that lets us increase our standard of living uh, while recognizing that the scarcity of resources, natural resources, and not undermining uh, the ecosystem and the environment we need for our water, for our food, for the air we breathe, for energy. And I, I think we're close to the tipping point globally in, in, in these issues. And of course, uh, the Chinese are focused on this big time and they need a new model of urbanization. And I, I believe they will achieve one. And that's really why I'm spending the amount of time I'm spending there. Do you get the feeling though that the alarm bells have gone off recently? Yes, uh, I, I think, well, first of all, that the, um, they've been focused on this for some time. They understand it. Uh, but what you've seen with this, the dirty air has gotten a lot of, a lot of attention. And of course, the air in Beijing is dirty, uh, largely because we've, there's a cold winter and you've got these, these, uh, these migrant workers who don't have the same economic benefits that others have in China. There's something in the neighborhood of 300 million migrants from, from the farms that come to the cities and they don't have the same economic benefits, they don't have the same education benefits, uh, and to, to keep themselves warm, they've been burning dirty coal, or, or coal, which is, which is the cheapest coal they can find to stay warm. And, you know, if you look more broadly, you know, for, I, you know, I spend a lot of time with, uh, with people that are my contemporaries and some of whom discount climate change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're, when you're looking at 50 degrees below in, in Russia, you know, snowing in Istanbul, burning tires to stay warm in Kuala Lumpur, you know, the, the, the coal in Beijing, I, I think that there's, you know, that this is a serious global problem and I don't think we can solve this in the U.S. alone. The only way you're going to solve it is developing new clean technologies that can be rolled out on a cost-efficient basis in scale in the developing world and particularly China. Does the migrant workers or the coal burn, not, not just cars and not just coal-fired power plants? Oh, oh, oh yeah. See, okay, when, so you, when you not say... Not to belabor this. But when you say, but I just say this mm -hmm. to say what... But, because mm -hmm. I'll get to it. When you say, mm -hmm. what are the things that China needs to do in, in, in terms of the economic model for reform, mm -hmm. you started off by saying, which is true, they need to move to more domestic uh, growth mm -hmm. and a bigger services sector, less reliance on exports and heavy government investment in infrastructure and resource intensive exports. But they also need to normalize the labor market, which is a, a, a tricky thing to do because they, and, but if they do it, and if they uh, take the restrictions off, you know, migrant, uh, the migrant workers as they go to the city, and if that's done properly, there will be a consumption dividend. So they've got to do that. That's probably the second thing I'd say they need to do. The, the, uh, the, the, the third thing I would point out, which we've talked about, is to, to deal with these environmental issues that are so, so, so okay. tough. They, they also need to continue the reform of the state-owned enterprises. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they need to, uh, you know, reform the financial markets, which we've talked about, and then this urbanization. They need a new model for urbanization uh, where they're going to continue to be able to do this process on a magnitude and scale which is unprecedented and do it where they minimize some of these social, environmental, and economic stresses. And big part of that will be municipal finance mm -hmm. because right now they're overly reliant on land sales, taking the farmer's land, selling it, and opaque means of finance. And, and so you need to come up with a system where mayors and governors have got their own budget and it's transparent and mm -hmm. they've got authority. So they've, they've got a lot to do. 
All right, let's switch over to uh, another difficult uh, subject, quite frankly, which is hacking. Um, and um, a, a tricky subject um, when it comes to US-Chinese relations. So I guess there's a couple questions. Um, is the Chinese government behind hacking the United States, uh, institutions in the United States, companies and government? Um, if so, how bad is it? And if so, how should the US respond? OK, well, let me start with a little background. So first of all, uh, I think all governments engage in intelligence gathering vis-a-vis -vis other governments. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the big point of friction and tension comes when a government or a, or, or a company uh, uh, gathers intelligence you know, th through hacking, gather, ga gathers intelligence trade secrets from, from, from US uh, companies. And that's the point of, uh, of friction. And here, I start off by saying, I think it's really important for you know, all companies to do everything they can to protect themselves and, uh, against cyber theft of all, of all kinds. And it's also the responsibility of their government to help ensure uh, you know, that this uh, economic uh, security. Now, with, so now let's, let's move to China. The, we, this is a major area of, of, of tension with China, and, and rightfully so. We desperately need some international, some global protocols and ways of enforcing this. And we need to find common ground uh, w w with China on these things. Because it's in, it's, it's in everyone's interest to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that, that, that uh, economic security is, is maintained. Now, um, as, as I look at it, the Chinese have the same strong interest that we do and every other major nation has in preserving our global economic system and not have it collapse because uh, we can't agree, agree on uh, rules to enforce economic stability. So th this, th this to me is something that uh, is, is, is a really important area. Um, so what do you think, uh, just to follow up on that, do you think that the Obama administration, mm -hmm. the Obama administration has been slow to criticize China on, call China on this, I guess you should say, but recently they did. Do you think that's an appropriate response? Well, I think the, the, the Obama administration is clearly got a responsibility to, uh, to help our, our comp companies protect mm -hmm. their, uh, their, um, their, their intellectual property and uh, their, their, their trade secrets. And uh, I, I think as, as we look at what we need in this country, we need, I, I think, stronger laws. Uh, we need to be able to enforce the laws. Uh, I, I think businesses need to do a much better job of hardening their uh, their, their their computer systems, mm -hmm. uh, so they're that they're not as vulnerable. And I think they need to do a better job of reporting it, an attack immediately. And then we need the laws, and we need to enforce those laws. Okay. In in your book on the brink, and by the way, I should let everyone know that you're working on a new book about China. Uh, which will be out in a year or so, something like that, right? Early next year. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, everyone should have read, I hope, uh, your first book. I believe it's your first book, is that right? Yeah. On the Brink, yeah. um, which is about the financial crisis. And um, one point that I pulled out of that that I thought was kind of um, interesting was in September of 2008, um, things were, were bad, obviously, de deteriorating very fast here in the United States. And, you notified then Vice Premier Wang Kishen and to sort of give him an update, I think, about what was going on here. Yeah. Um, 
and you kind of warned him, and he, he, and you said, but maybe things are okay, and he said, well, actually, uh, Hank, maybe things could get worse, so be careful. He kind of <laughs> warned you back a little bit, which I thought was a fascinating interchange. Yeah. But that led me to the question, um, how and how closely do the Chinese monitor the U.S. economy? Well, I, I think that, uh, of course, they, uh, th they monitor it carefully, that they were highly reliant on exports. And I, I think that the financial crisis was the first wake-up call they had. I think the second one was the European crisis. And I think now they just they just really understand that, you know, what's their economy? $8 trillion now. And, mm -hmm. and if you look at uh, e Europe, uh, the U.S., uh, Japan, that's $35 trillion. And so that th it, it's they just can't insulate themselves against what's happening in in, in the broader world uh, when they're as reliant as they are on exports. And uh, so I think that's another reason why they're working so hard to uh, to, to to have more domestic like growth. But yeah, the, the the Chinese were were quite aware of what was going on because they, as you know, were big investors in Treasury uh, securities. They're the largest holder of our treasuries. They were the, the largest foreign holders of, uh, of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac securities. So they had a big interest. And, uh, and uh, frankly, I think that the, um, the relationships we maintained and the level of trust we built up through the strategic economic dialogue really it led to a very constructive relationship. And they, they behaved in a very responsible way Throughout the uh, throughout the crisis, and we we communicated frequently, and uh, and uh, even to the point that when George Bush made a very important decision, which was to uh, when, when he called a global le global leaders meeting to deal with the crisis. Uh, he made a decision to go with the G20. You know, heretofore, there, you know, you had the G7 finance mm -hmm. ministers, the G8 leaders, and there was a G20 group that was finance ministers and central bankers. So he decided that the G20 was much more representative of the global economy. But he rightfully had some concerns and said, well, would there be a constructive outcome? And so one of the things he asked beforehand was to... to he asked me to take a quick sounding to get to you know to, to Hu Jintao, the president, through mm -hmm. Wang Xishong, mm -hmm. to see whether the Chinese were willing to assume a, a leadership role and play a constructive mm -hmm. role. And they got back very quickly, which I think then made it easier for President Bush to decide to go with the, G, the G20, which which obviously made a and has made a lot of sense. Okay, sticking with the financial sector, what, what is the number one uh, priority um, in terms of reform that China should look to in the financial sector? Well, I, I would, to, to come down with, to number one, I think is difficult. There's, there, there's really several things that they need to do. But I think one thing I would look at to to see how serious they are about reform is to say, will they open up their markets to foreign competition? Because I can't, I, I don't know of a single market where there's a fish, where f efficient world-class capital markets mm -hmm. where you don't let the best institutions come in and compete. It's hard to run a world-class institution as a joint venture. And um, so the argument that I've made to the Chinese is that you know if, if you let foreign banks come in, they're going to be regulated by the Chinese. They will they be employing Chinese professionals. And it's only by doing that will you have world-class financial markets. Now, the things that I think that are important to the Chinese are that right now their, their private sector is not getting the capital it needs out of their current system. And having you know, really efficient capital markets, you're going to 
come up with a more efficient allocation of capital to the private sector. And then the other thing is investors. Investors in China, uh, you, know, you, you have a bit of a real estate bubble because when you say where can they invest their, 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 their money, it's, it's, it's real estate is one of the, the, the few areas where they feel comfortable in investing. And to be able to, I argue, having world-class investing institutions in there will help China become a nation of investors, not just savers. And right now, you have over savings in China for, for, for two reasons. Uh, one, because they, it's fear-based savings. You don't, have, you, you don't have adequate safety nets, social security and welfare. And the other is they don't get really good returns on their investment. You know, the, so interest rate liberalization will be very important. What happens is a Chinese investor has got a few places to go, as I said, other than real estate, or you can put it in a bank savings account yeah. and not get the rate of inflation. Um, and, and then that's a subsidy that really gets passed on to state-owned enterprises in terms of lowering borrowing rate. But it doesn't help the private sector, and it doesn't help the Chinese a saver or investor. Okay. So I'd say interest rate liberalization would be one thing to, to really look at, and then uh, you know opening up to uh, to competition, so you can have world class institutions. And you think those are likely to happen? I'm optimistic, and the reason I'm optimistic is when you look at what they've done. That uh, Zhou Xiaotren, who is the you know the chairman of the PBOC, their central mm -hmm. bank. Right. Uh, was given, he was, it reached uh, retirement age and he's been asked to stay on. And he's been a big advocate of, of financial market reform. Lo Jiwei, who again is a real reformer, worked with Zhu Ranji in the old days, is, is, is now the Minister of Finance. And the Chinese SEC, the CSRC, is going to be chaired by a man named Xiao Gong who had been previously, I, I know him well, he was chairman of the Bank of China. And again, mm -hmm. I, I think these are all very knowledgeable professionals, pro-reformers, and I, I think they've got, but it, it remains to be seen, because I would say in any, uh, anywhere you have success, um, there, uh, you, you, a certain amount of success, there's resistance to change. And, there's, so I, I, I would just simply say we, we, we have it in vested interests. We have it, we're a very different system, but we have vested interests in our system. They've got vested interests in their system. And uh, so they're going to be anti-reformers. I want to switch over um, to some questions from the audience. This is one from Luis. Uh, and he asks, what are your thoughts about the recent Apple China dispute. Do you think it was necessary for Tim Cook to issue a public apology to the Chinese people? Well, uh, Luis, I, I read the same Wall Street Journal article and Financial Times article you read, but uh, I will, so let me put it in, in perspective. China is a huge market, and U.S. companies and all sorts of companies are benefiting greatly by participating in that market. So Apple historically had looked at China as, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the factory of the world. And so uh, Apple, uh, you know, uh, computers, iPhones, and so on were assembled in, in, in China and sold, you know, in, in the U.S. and around the world. But what's happened as and with economic growth and greater prosperity in China, it's become a big market, end market. Right. And so I think it's well over $20 billion of, of, of sales this year. It's their fastest growing market. Some people think it's the fastest market for, for, for smartphones in the world right now. And so Apple's got a big uh, percentage of, you know, got a big stake in that market. And I think what you're going to see is uh, foreign companies, and there's a good number of, 
of U.S. companies and other foreign companies that have got leadership positions, that they're, they're going to be under a, a lot of scrutiny. They're going to be held to a very high standard by, by regulators. There's, you know, there's, uh, you know, the, the, I, I'm not saying all of this is fair, but I, I would tell you when the Chinese look at what happens to some of their countries, companies in the U.S., uh, that they don't always think it's fair. And I would say that, uh, that this is a, I would say the good news uh, for Apple and for the U.S. and for the Chinese and for the world is that that's our fastest growing export market, that that's a market that's growing very quickly and it's, and it's very important to Apple. And, and you know, what, what happened was they were criticized on state TV they started off arguing that the, 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 their customer service and you know their their business norms were the same in China as elsewhere, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, Cook ended up apologizing, and which is this is a big important market. Okay. This is a question from Zheng Zhai, I hope I'm saying that right, a GW graduate student. Um, there are two questions here. I think you may have touched on the first one a lot, but the, the, you can answer both of them if you'd like. Do you think China needs to make political reforms in order to achieve a sustainable economic, to achieve sustainable economic growth? And the second, what's the next most important economic growth engine for China in the next few decades? Maybe the second one's something you'd want to... Uh, okay, well, I'd, I'd say, first of all, I didn't talk about political reform. Mm -hmm. Okay. I talked about... So I, I do believe that... Um, and I've, I've, I've always believed that economic reform, economic freedom, uh, greater economic uh, integration with the rest of the world quite naturally will lead to more personal liberties, which it has over time, and a political reform. Now... The, the Chinese political system is still evolving. You know, the, the last transition, the one before this, was the first time when it went to Jiang Zemin that a sitting leader didn't didn't select his successor. This was this was the uh, second one. Um, you know, I think the way to understand China is they look through the lens of political stability. So when making any tough decision, whether it's in international relations, whether it's in economic issues, environmental issues, whatever, they're going to say, what is the path that's going to give us the greatest stability? And the argument that I make is speeding up uh, economic reforms and political reforms rather than undermining stability is going to be the quickest path to stability. And I believe that will be the case, it be proved to be the case of political reforms. And there's a lot of discussion and debate in China how the political reforms will take place. I think the general view is it'll take place first within the context of the party and experimenting in, at the local elections, village elections. Maybe giving more, you know, real authority to the uh, to the National Congress, uh, People's Congress. Uh, so uh, yeah, I do believe that's another challenge, and I believe that for economic, uh, you know, for for real economic stability, it, it's going to you know continued political reform uh, will, will be necessary. What about China's uh, military, uh, Mr. Secretary? Should China expand um, its military, make it bigger? Um, and I ask you uh, that given the backdrop of the Pinnacle Islands, uh, which, are the, which is, I believe is the U.S. name for the islands that are disputed between China and Japan, and of course, uh, what's going on in, uh, in the Korean Peninsula? Okay, well, let me, uh, so, uh, Deal with that. I just I give you two sentences on the second question oh, you'd asked me before, sorry. which is the biggest driver, and I think it'll be I think mm -hmm. it will be urbanization if they get it right. Okay. In other words, I think that the the productivity if, if someone goes from the farm to a second tier city, their economic their income goes from like equivalent of forty dollars a month to a hundred, and if they go to a first tier city, like it's two hundred. So if they get that right and get the mm -hmm. consumption 
boost, that, that will be the biggest uh, driver coming up with this, th th this urbanization model of, uh, of economic growth going forward. Okay, so um, you've got a bunch of questions in there. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I did. Uh, threw them all in. So, so whether China, whether China, China should continue expanding their military, or you know, is is sort of what, what I think about it, or you think about it, is sort of irrelevant. They will keep expanding their mm -hmm. military. Okay. A and uh, and um, uh, and from their perspective, you know, our military is, you know, our, our military spending exceeds the. You know the top 15 company countries put together. Right. Now, uh, so I always explain to them and to everyone, it's important for us to be strong in Asia and around the world, economically, diplomatically, and militarily. And 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 that uh, our presence in the Asia Pacific has been important for a long uh, to, to everyone, including China, because it's assured stability and. And you've you've got this trade and economic cross investment and and growth that's benefited all of us. Okay, so now you see the, the, the sort of two troubling things that are, that are go, that are going on. Um, one, you know, in, in the East China Sea, uh, the, the dispute in uh, Japan and China, the Senkaku. You know, the J Japanese call it the Senkaku, mm -hmm. the Chinese call it. Uh, DOI islands, and uh, and you know when you when when you look at the the, the merits there, it's 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 easy to understand it from both sides because you look at history. There's a there, 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 there's merit on both sides, but this is uh, th this is dangerous. I think the points that that the U.S. makes just continually to to both sides is. There needs to be really good control, right down to the boat commander uh, level, and mm -hmm. great channels of communication at the top political levels, the top military levels, the boat commander levels, because there's there there's been a, a lot of tension. Now I'm optimistic that the uh, the new the new foreign minister, Wang Yi, is is is, is a is someone who speaks Japanese, is a Japanese expert, and that you know that he's selected to go into that role and to, to and that, that they will uh, and that both sides will be able to de-escalate because you know this you know stability is just totally necessary for the kinds of economic uh, um, growth that Asia needs and the world needs and for the st stability in the region and and. And then, of course, in the South China Sea, that's that's a different, because this is territorial. Uh, China has territorial disputes with just about everyone: the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, and then various countries have territorial disputes among the, themselves. And there, we don't take sides. We we just simply say, listen, it's just unacceptable as it is in. With, with, with in the East China Sea with the Japanese, that they're not that these be resolved peaceably, not with force, the threat of force or coercion, that they be resolved peaceably, and um, and we we, we need uh, you know some solutions in both the South China Sea and the uh, and and the East China Sea. And Korea. How long okay. is China uh, going to let uh, uh, well, that situation well, 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 Korea, continue to go? Korea, the you know, going? you get I, again. I'm reading the same newspapers you are, but mm -hmm. from lo looking from from a vantage point of of watching it closely and watching it when I was Treasury Secretary, in in one respect, this is uh, although this is a more extreme, virulent form, but it's uh, of, of of North Korea's customary. Disruptive, outlandish, uh, threatening behavior. So this is this this is just is a worst form of mm -hmm. uh, of what we've seen. Uh, number one. Now you've got to take it seriously when you've got a rogue state developing uh, nuclear weapons. And I look at this w w with your point, right? right in, in your question, this is a 
a, a case in point of why the U.S.-China relations are so important. Mm -hmm. one, one of the reasons, that, you know, when, when I talk about it, I say it's hard to think of any major problem in the world that isn't going to be easier to solve if the U.S. and China work together and isn't going to be much more difficult to solve if we're at odds with each other. And so I think when looking at almost any problem, uh, one way we should think about it is what does it take to get China aboard? And if we can get China aboard, uh, it will be easier. Now, on this one, it, it's been difficult because on, uh, you know, on the one hand, the Chinese are very angry at the, at the kinds of behaviors you're seeing uh, with Kim Jong-un and, and, and that, that regime. On the other, they've propped it up uh, economically because they don't want a collapsed state on their border and they don't want South Korea right on their border. And so the way I tend to think about it is it's highly important that we be communicating regularly and doing contingency planning in terms of how to deal with the worst outcomes because at, at, at the highest level, we have the same interest, which is peace, stability, uh, you know, e economic growth in China and in Asia and around the world, and, uh, and but we need to be prepared uh, to, in terms of how we're going to deal with some, you know, even if they're not high likelihood outcomes, outcomes where, you know, North Korea uses force or you have a, you know, a, a collapsed state or, or, or what have you. We're out of time, but I do want to ask you just one more question from the audience, and that is, what potential role, if any, do you see for international students and Asian Americans in bettering and strengthening U.S.-China ties? Well, that, that's, that's a, a great question. Uh, and I would start off by saying the, the, the reason that, uh, that, you know, that I've set up the Paulson Institute is I believe there are going to be ups and downs in our you know, mutual relationship. Um, based upon what the issues of the day are in, in Beijing or in Washington. But we need, and to, to come back to Andy's point, one of, the, one of the, the disturbing things about military, you know, relations with, with, with China is our two militaries don't like each other that much and we don't have the same level of trust that we have in the economic arena. The economic arena, there's tension, but that's the good news. I mean, 40 years ago, we didn't have economic relations. Uh, with, with China, we had no tensions. You always have tension with your trading partners, but if there's problems, there's all kinds of trust and channels of communication. So we need ways of getting our two militaries to work together on humanitarian missions or, you know, the, the, these dialogues, you know, which we're pursuing, you know, are, need to work better. But uh, there's nothing like students. And the, the more knowledge we have of each other, the more we know about each other, the more we'll trust each other, the more we'll like each other. And it, it, it's, it, you don't make, make adversaries. It's, it's hard to make it become an adversary of someone you understand. And one of the biggest problems we have is we have very different systems and very different cultures. And one of the things at the United States we don't do particularly well is understand others' cultures mm -hmm. and, and, and their systems. We're so proud of, uh, of, of our system and the way we are, we think what we have in every way is what, what's best for, for every other society. So having um, American students spend time in China, get to know Chinese, and vice versa, and this is growing quickly, I think is very important to, uh, to U.S.-China relations going forward. Great, well I think that's a, a wonderful note uh, to end on, and obviously I think we, we covered a lot of ground. Um, much more to talk about, but we'll have to save that for another day. So uh, please join me in thanking Secretary Hank Paulson. And thank you to everyone here at GW. Thank you very much. Thank you.